Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. The webcast is part of ACM's commitment to long-time learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. Hi, I'm Ankur Tere Desai, co-founder and chief technology officer of Kensai, and a professor of computer science and systems at the University of Washington, Tacoma. My research spans data science with its applications for societal impact in healthcare, and I also serve as the executive director for the UW Center for Data Science. Uh, till recently, I was the information officer of ACM Special Interest Group in Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining, uh, the leading organization for industry and academic researchers in data science. I'm also proud to be an ACM member. And for more background on me uh, and my efforts in explainable healthcare, uh, please check out my bio and window on your screen. For those who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here is some information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster the skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen here. Before we get started, let's uh, uh, like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows or Command R if you are on a Mac or refresh your browser on a mobile device. You, or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during this webinar, and we encourage those, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. Uh, I'll here organize the questions as our presenters speak, and they'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check back on learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please do take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. You may also open the link to the survey at any time from the resources window on your screen. You can use a Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends as well as tweets coming and questions during the uh, webinar using the hashtag ACM Learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We also have a new community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions we may not be able to answer to get you through the Q&A session. Today's presentation is Explainable Machine Learning Models for Healthcare AI by my colleagues Dr. Carly Eckert, Muhammad Aurangzeb Ahmed, Vikas Kumar, and myself, Ankur Tiridesai. I'd like to quickly introduce the speakers here with me. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Carly Eckert, uh, Medical Director of Clinical Informatics at Kensai. In this low, uh, role, she leads and works with doctors, data scientists, and developers to identify patterns in patient data to predict risk that can cost-effectively improve care outcomes. Dr. Eckert is trained in general surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and in occupational and environmental medicine and preventative medicine at the University of Washington. Dr. Carly has also co-authored several publications on the topics related to general surgery, occupational health, and occupational injury, and recently co-authored a publication accepted for presentation at AAAI Death versus data science, predicting the end of life. Joining us also is Dr. Muhammad Aurangzeb Ahmed, as the principal data scientist at Kensai. His work is focused on applying machine learning to solve problems within healthcare, and his research at Kensai is focused on interpretable machine learning, fairness in machine learning, and causal machine learning models within the context of healthcare. After working in applied ML in various domains, Muhammad found his calling in healthcare 
where he saw great potential in using machine learning to improve the lives of people. He has taught machine learning and data science at the University of Washington and was a visiting research scientist at the in Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. I'd like to welcome Muhammad to the panel as well. Vikas Kumar, uh, joining us here, is a data scientist also working at Kensai. In this role, Vikas works with a team of data scientists and clinicians to build consumable and trustworthy machine learning solutions for healthcare. Vikas's focus is in building explainable models in healthcare and application of recommendation systems in clinical settings. Prior to Kensai, Vikas was pursuing his doctorate in computer science at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. You can find more information on all our backgrounds uh, in the bio window on your screen. And now, without further ado, the presentation. But before we go there, uh, let's move to a few questions to get us to understand the audience who's joining us for the session today. Our first question is, what's your background? Are you from academia, healthcare industry, non-healthcare industry, the government, or other uh, industries? We would appreciate if you could take a few seconds to answer the poll question. Thank you for the answers. Uh, looks like majority of our viewers are from academia and industry, a uh, few from the healthcare industry and few from the non-healthcare industry. We have another question. Uh, what are the, which of the following domains do you work in? Please select all that apply to you. Do you work in AI or machine learning? Do you exclusively focus on explainable AI and interpretable machine learning domain? Or do you work generally, uh, and do you work generally in the AI ML in healthcare space? Again, we would appreciate your responses. Awesome. Thank you for responding. Uh, it appears a majority of the audience today works in the AI and ML domain, with a significant portion of them, about 26.5%, also working in the explainable AI and interpretable ML domain. Uh, a lot of them also work in the AI and health, ML domain in healthcare. So we have a very uh, educated and, and uh, interesting audience, and we look forward to a great participation in the form of questions and commentary. A quick introduction about Kensai. So Kensai was founded out of the University of Washington uh, almost three years ago. It was conceived in academia, uh, supported by grants and collaborations with several federal agencies, and it is trusted today by leading healthcare systems globally. We have had the great fortune of serving 57 million lives or so. We extensively publish in various leading journals and conferences in AI as well as in, in the medical literature field. Uh, we were proud to be nominated the 2018 finalist for the Microsoft Partner of the Year. Uh, we won the Microsoft Innovation Award of the Year this year, and we have participated quite actively in various IEEE as well as ACM conferences, notably KDD, of course. Kensai is not just a company uh, with data scientists and engineers at its core. We are actually driven by our clinical team and work collaboratively across various healthcare problems. If you would like to know more, please do reach out to us at kensai.com. With that, let me launch into the main topic of today, explainable models in artificial intelligence. To set the context, I would like the audience to uh, appreciate uh, a bit of humor in the morning for all of us to get, get warmed up. Uh, here is a doctor, of course, and he's saying uh, that this patient doesn't really have any illness. Uh, and when the patient complains that their head still hurts, uh, the doctor is reassuring the patient that, that they're fine and the algorithm or the computer has given them 
hundreds of reasons uh, that they are okay. Uh, on a more uh, somber note, in a recent paper by Lipton titled The Doctor Just Won't Accept It, uh, the authors discuss how the doctors, clinicians in general, are very interested in predicting risk of mortality, risks of patients' readmission to the hospital, and recognizing cancer in radiology scans. As data scientists, we can often train models and even retune the models. As engineers, we can operationalize such models into production, but we can't just tell the doctor, my neural network says this patient has cancer. Or even worse, as the joke above implies, I refuse you treatment because my AI solution thinks you are not at risk. The entire medical professional community would want to know why an algorithm says what it says. In short, they need an explanation. In order to generate those explanations, they need explainable models. With the advent of machine learning inter integrating seamlessly in sensitive domains such as healthcare, criminal justice, financial lending, to name a few, we need to know why a model makes a certain decision. Further, we need to know what could be changed and what is actionable to make that decision different. Then we need to know how to make the model more fair, uh, safe and reliable. This leads us to understand the where. Where, in what settings, is the model robust and sensible? Eventually, if we answer all these questions, we may only begin to scratch the surface of our understanding of the when. When is it appropriate to make decisions by trusting the historic data on which the models were built and the appropriate explanations the model is providing? In this shared journey between humans and AI, if you take away anything from this tutorial and webinar today, it would be this. There is very little consensus yet on what is explainable AI and how to evaluate it for benchmarking purposes. Our efforts here are to shine the light on the need for a very rigorous exploration of this field, specifically as it applies to healthcare, and also to give you hope that everyone working in this area is making rapid advances that will make it very exciting and rewarding to join this exploration. Uh, hopefully, that gives you a sense of the gravity with which we need to approach this problem as well as the space of explainable AI in healthcare. Currently, explainable AI falls into a soup of phrases. Some researchers refer to it as explainable. Others like to talk about it as interpretable. Um, some like to say explainable AI is intelligible AI. These are all distinct words in English language, yet they all imply a very similar notion of knowledge of the end user. Hence, in our research here at Kensai, we have decided to use the simplest form of the term, explainable. The reason being, explainable is the idea to make something clear to someone by describing it in more detail or revealing relevant facts. Hence, when we talk about explainable AI, the motivation behind explainable AI in healthcare is to make an idea or situation clear to someone to help them make decisions by revealing the relevant facts. We are not the first ones, of course, to do so. Uh, the foundations of logic uh, have been founded historically on clear and explicit reasoning, uh, explainable to almost anyone. In the early uh, 18th century, Bayes, uh, who we all know well from, from the uh, Bayesian theorem, uh, was grounded in probability and inference uh, on solid theoretical foundations of explainability of the logic. But the goal of early AI was, in fact, to mimic human reasoning mechanically. Early expert systems such as Mycin were actually explainable systems. Uh, the push around explainability also started when ensembles started making their first appearance to solve very important problems in production in the 1980s. The current interest in explainability has increased significantly because of the widespread adoption and deployment of machine learning algorithms from uh, auto-driving cars or self-driving cars to the field of healthcare, to the field of criminal justice, 
and financial uh, you know, uh, transactions. So all around us, we are grounded in uh, theory from history, but we are progressing very fast and we need to understand what theoretical guarantees and motivations we can provide to make AI explainable. But what does it really mean to make AI explainable or interpretable? Uh, as, as seen on the screen here, uh, there's a longish equation of a standard model Lagrangian. Now, this equation may be actually explainable to someone who is well-versed in uh, theoretical physics or in, in mathematics, but for a normal human, it may not be comprehensible in natural language. So the idea behind explainable AI is for humans to be able to use their domain knowledge to understand why the prediction is being made, the way it is being made, and make it comprehensible to humans in natural language and easy to understand representations. It's also important to understand that explanations is more than just explainable models. <clears throat> so far, you may have thought that explainable AI is in the same light as explanations produced by an accompanying AI model. I want to emphasize that in a field as rich and complex as healthcare, and in many such emerging fields, the notion of explainable AI is not limited to models. To make explainable AI truly interpretable, to understand what is and how to evaluate the explainable qualities of the entire system, the entire system has to be explainable. Thus, we must stand the test of, uh, thus we must stand the test of explainability, for example, both from the context of the end user use case to the application and its ability to open and inspect the trust via quantifiable proxy benchmarks compared to other systems like it. When answering the question, hey, is the system useful because it is explainable based on the user's cognitive capacity, the domain knowledge, as well as the granularity of the explanations that are needed. Uh, all of this must be taken into account in an AI pipeline, all the way from preachers to models to make them open and interpretable. Needless to say, uh, starting from very early work that we did at the UW Tacoma Center for Data Science to our continued efforts at Kensai, we have focused our attention on both the aspects of explainable AI in healthcare where we not just focus on the AI solution to become explainable, but also uh, for the domain users in healthcare to become uh, you know, cognitively capable to understand those explanations through surfacing the right set of uh, explanations that accompany uh, machine learning solutions. But what are explanations? Rather, what are not explanations? Uh, the need is urgent for solving this problem. So it is best for us to understand that explanations are different from justifications. Uh, when, uh, and there, is, there are a couple of very nice papers by, uh, by Ryan et al. explaining uh, the reasons behind giving the prediction. So justification is simply putting an explanation in the context of the output or the prediction of the model. But justification doesn't necessarily have to correspond to how the model actually works, whereas explanation has to provide the underlying uh, uh, thesis behind why that explanation was produced. Um, moreover, there is a big debate in the community today on explanation versus causality. And we would like to, uh, our position on it is that explanations are mostly not causal. Moreover, they are not prescriptive in any, na in, in any nature. For example, uh, you know, predicting the end of life for heart failure patient uh, and, and surfacing the top factors that may help a clinical decision support to understand which factors a physician may be missing in analyzing the heart failure risk of the patient uh, may not be necessarily causal, but it is still very useful within the healthcare domain. <clears throat> With that, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, pass on uh, to, uh, to, to understand how healthcare AI is focusing on, uh, on, these, uh, on these problems. Uh, so the key question here comes about is, how are healthcare decisions made, or how are decisions made in healthcare? Traditionally, uh, healthcare has focused on heuristics. Uh, physicians often look at seven to nine factors 
in order to make 80% of the care decisions. Uh, with the advent of rule-based systems and automation, such as EHRs, the number of factors in clinical decision support has increased significantly, but uh, still about only 18% of care decisions are made using uh, rule-based systems. Today, uh, majority of supervised learning uh, algorithms are used in care decisions uh, towards radiology, uh, imaging, and, and certain other use cases, but still the number of factors that they can surface are in the hundreds. As we all know, a machine learning model can, uh, can incorporate hundreds or even thousands of features, but very few care decisions are being made based on truly ML-based systems. The reasoning behind that, or at least we believe that the reason behind that is uh, the idea that if we made healthcare AI more explainable, uh, the adoption of ML-based systems, making it open and interpretable, uh, will increase, thereby somewhat decreasing the fatigue that physicians often face in these settings. How can machine learning uh, improve healthcare across this continuum of care? What are the key challenges in this space? Uh, as you see on the slide here, uh, there is hopefully a very nice uh, ideation of how utilization of resources happens in any healthcare system uh, across from birth all the way to death. Uh, how does the complexity of healthcare shape up in terms of the resources that are consumed by the system. At various points, all the way from uh, initial birth of optimizing hospital efficiency doing variation analysis to preventative care, where we optimize clinic operations for benefits of the patient, uh, we have outlined a series of machine learning problems uh, and solutions that can help. These prediction models uh, can be designed on data sets available within each context. Let me take an example of chronic disease management and diabetes, for example. Typically, patients in their 60s, uh, approaching the 70s, start becoming high utilizers for care in the health system. And there are various prediction models that are possible at that time, uh, such as predicting the risk of disease progression for diabetes, predicting diabetic complications, even predicting which patients will likely to have uh, uncontrolled diabetes at any given point of time during their diabetic uh, complexity. Uh, recently, as I pointed out earlier, Dr. Carly and Muhammad have worked extensively on end-of-life prediction and trying to understand how transition to hospice can be done much sooner uh, than later in order to improve the quality of life of patients at the end of their journey. Uh, hopefully this gives us a sense of the importance of healthcare AI and how machine learning models can help across the continuum of care. In the running example that we will use today, we will take a patient and walk that patient through the journey of various prediction models and how it applies to explainable ML in healthcare. But operationalizing healthcare AI is something completely different. Uh, many of us might have read this very famous paper by Scully in 2015 that only a small fraction of real-world machine learning problems actually constitute machine learning code. So while we spend 80 to 90 percent of our energy in doing uh, ML, uh, feature construction, feature engineering, data exploration, and eventual machine learning models and algorithms, there is a lot to be done in operationalizing AI in healthcare all the way from configuring pipelines to collecting the right set of data to validating and verifying that data uh, and then mo monitoring and managing the serving infrastructure that then processes that data in a pipeline. Each of these facets play a key role in making the entire uh, healthcare AI system or a platform explainable to its core. Moreover, the reason for explainable AI in healthcare stems from the importance of data complexity in operationalizing AI in healthcare. The syntactic correctness of data is more crucial in healthcare than in any other field. Um, the right format of the data, 
the right ontology that is used underlying the, uh, the data sources often comes into play while trying to understand which of the factors may be explainable and which may not be explainable. Uh, moreover, when we try to make these decisions actionable, the morphological correctness of that data, for example, is the data within range of possible values? Uh, has it been validated through that pipeline? Is the machine learning model receiving and outputting the right set of uh, information actionable at the right time all becomes an important consideration in the quality and robustness of the explainable model. The semantic correctness of, uh, of the models also plays a very high role. Uh, do the variables actually correspond to what they are being prescribed as? Uh, for example, a, va a variable that encodes such as blood pressure uh, as high or low, so essentially discretizing blood, blood pressure uh, to be high or low, will have a very different semantic for pediatrics compared to adults. When you start considering all these aspects in the data complexity, uh, the importance of explainable machine learning uh, simply rises to the top in order to make it effective and actionable. There is another aspect to the need for explanations in healthcare AI today. The number of papers and publications in healthcare AI is increasing rapidly. The application of machine learning uh, is increasing because more data is becoming available for healthcare practitioners, more machine learning algorithms and techniques are being developed to specifically address the world of healthcare, but still the implications of these models and their performance for end patient outcomes is still unknown. Uh, and in some cases, we need to focus our attention on the utility of those models very carefully. We also need to understand when is the need for explanations obvious? One might think that explanations are always needed in healthcare, and that may be the right view, but it is becoming increasingly important uh, to understand the need for explanations in healthcare because of recent regulations, particularly in the European Union. Uh, the regulation will actually require algorithms to make decisions based on user level predictions, which significantly affect the user to provide explanation. This is actually termed as the right to explanation in the recent GDPR context. Moreover, uh, when fairness is critical in decision making, the consequences of that are far reaching and we need it even more. <clears throat> Why do we need explanations now? There are examples of black box models that have not worked in healthcare. One of the main stumbling blocks that we see uh, in wide adoption of AI in healthcare or the, or, the, or, the, uh, or the propensity of the public at large to think about uh, death robots that will be put in place in order to make care decisions for patients uh, is very real. And we feel that explanations today can help alleviate some of those concerns. Uh, there are examples of intelligible ML already emerging in healthcare. Pioneering work by uh, Rich Karuana shed the light on the problem of how when we dig deep, we can find that simple explanations help us understand why the model is behaving in a certain way. It can also help us understand when to trust the model or not. For example, um, in recent papers, Karuana found that patients having asthma actually have a lower risk of mortality from pneumonia, which was quite a surprising result, and it was not explainable at that time. But when the researchers dug deeper into the problem, uh, trying to understand why this is so and why is the model predicting a lower risk for patients with asthma compared to patients without asthma for risk of mortality, they, they found out that uh, the, the patients who actually have asthma get more intensive care. And when the black box neural network model was predicting a lower risk for asthmatic patients, it was not able to explain why but then further investigation enabled uh, us to understand the reason for that explanation. And it became quite apparent that the model has some shortcomings, which led to groundbreaking work 
similarly, in radiology, uh, Finlayson's work on misdiagnosis versus adversarial attacks for uh, chest X-rays and dermoscopy has played a key role in trying to understand the utility of the importance of explainability in healthcare AI. With that, uh, I would like to take a quick pause and uh, ask the audience another poll question. Uh, in your domain, if you are forced to choose one, uh, which one would you choose for your model? So only click only one of the boxes. Uh, the empirical guarantee of high performance, as in high accuracy, high precision recall, uh, and and uh, and high uh, you know F1 score, uh, or the importance of exp explainability of those predictions at the cost of accuracy. Uh, we'll give audience a few minutes. We'll also use this time to transition from uh, me to Dr. Carly and Dr. Muhammad Ahmed to talk about the seven pillars of explainability. We have the results in. Uh, people would prefer, uh, by a wide margin, that predictions accompany or explanations accompany predictions rather than high performance, uh, which is exactly in line with the thesis of this webinar. Another question for the audience: What is the ideal explanation format in your domain or use case? Are you seeing that the relative importance of features through linear regression is most prevalent in, uh, in terms of explainability? Uh, are you observing that the healthcare industry at large is adopting more rule-based outputs, such as decision tree? Uh, or are you seeing that explanation via similar cases, such as case-based reasoning, for example, are found finding greater use? This will help us inform uh, the pillars of explainability and help us uh, understand together as a group how to shape the various pillars and which ones of them become relatively important. So please take a moment to answer that question. Thank you for your answers. Uh, seems like a tie between rule-based and, and, and case-based uh, and uh, lesser adoption of linear regression or rather a movement away from simple linear regression, which makes complete sense. Thank you so much. And I would like to invite Dr. Carly and Dr. Muhammad to take it from here. And I'll join you back towards the end of the webinar. Good afternoon. We'll be spending the remainder of this webinar discussing the pillars of explainable AI. Now, healthcare is a large, nuanced, and complicated topic. Explainable AI is as well. So, in an attempt to better understand this topic, we have described it with seven different pillars, as you can see here. Now, this list is neither exhaustive nor prescriptive. It is the way that we have developed to um, better understand this field. Now we've assigned each of these seven pillars to a different use case in healthcare, which we'll walk through. The use cases that we've selected for today are all um, based in the acute care setting, so and they deal with the patient um, and hospital. So we'll start first with transparency. We have here a patient that will describe these use cases, uh, framework, the framework around. Our patient is Catherine. She presents to the emergency department and is evaluated by an emergency department clinician. And many of us know that emergency departments are busy, hectic places. Often that the clinician or decision maker has little time to gather the data necessary and to make a decision related to the care of that patient. It's important to set in motion the processes required for patient care, that these decisions be made relatively quickly and accurately. Machine learning based predictions can be used to assimilate and parse the data available to quickly make a decision to aid the clinician. The explanation associated with this prediction can also be helpful as the clinician makes the decision. So with transparency, 
the clinician can actually see and understand the factors associated with the prediction. We can see here our patient has a relatively low likelihood of requiring admission. Although the actual model might be opaque to the clinician, the clinician can look at the features associated with that risk score and understand why the patient has such a low risk. Uh, and, then, and, uh, and then within transparency, there's the notion of transparency at the level of algorithms, at the level of models, and at the level of feature sets. And for a solution or a machine learning solution to be truly explainable, it should be transparent at all these three levels. What that means is that at all these three levels, it should be understandable by the end user. And the other orthogonal dimension is that uh, we should also talk about when we say the end user, what does transparency mean? That is, what is it? What, what, um, what is the quantity that we're talking about, and how is it uh, transparent to the end user? So, for example, say. Uh, uh, so, for example, say if the end user looks at say a graph that we are seeing over here, uh, it may be it may be easily understandable, and he or he or may not know what the corresponding equation. What, what is the meaning of the corresponding equation? Uh, there can be another use case, say, for deep learning. So the end user may be using that model, but he or she may not understand what, uh, how deep learning works. Also, with respect to that, so we can also talk about, uh, so given these constraints, what are the type of models which we can say that are transparent? Uh, semi-transparent or non-transparent. So intuitively speaking, uh, so deep learning is, is a set of models which is not very transparent. Uh, the same goes for uh, model output, say, from SVMs and gradient boosting models. Contrast that with models like, say, falling rule-based models, decision trees, regression models, uh, and then more recent models like LIME, which can be used to extract explanations from other models, which are very transparent. So for example, you can give the give the explanation or the output from these models to a clinician, and she may, she may easily be able to understand what the model means. Again, assuming that, that say, not just the model, but say the feature sets are also transparent. So for example, there could be, there could be certain circumstances where, where the model and the algorithm are very transparent, but the set of features that are being used are highly engineered. So in that particular case, uh, the, the whole, machine learning solution is not going to be very transparent to the end user. The second pillar we have to discuss is that of domain <laughs> sense. And really what this is about is servicing the right explanation to the right person at the right time and in the right way. It's important that the features that are associated with an explanation be relevant to the end user and ideally also be actionable. In terms of um, ED census, that is predicting how crowded an emergency department might be at a given time, that prediction might be relevant to an ED charge nurse, for example, or an, um, an ED administrator. But it's also crucial that the factors associated with that explanation be relevant to that end user um, for it to truly be uh, acted on. And then within the context of making, making sense of the domain, there are two dimensions which are extremely important. So one is that just, just understanding the model output. So let's, as an example, let's, let's take the risk of readmission model output, which is, say in this particular case, a readmission risk score. Now suppose we give the output of risk score of 0.62 to a clinician. So the first question that he or she is going to ask is, what does 0.62 mean? Does that mean that, is it high risk, low risk, or medium risk? And the corresponding question, the question with respect to that is going to be that, what kind of actions uh, should I take or can I take? Which brings us to the next, to the, to the other orthogonal dimension, which is the actionability. Um, so, uh, which is the actionability? So from the perspective of end user, uh, just giving explanation in most healthcare contexts may not be sufficient. So for example, if your model is saying that the top factors or explanations are, say, related to demographics, say the age of the person, the ethnicity, or say the sex of the person, uh, then the clinician cannot really do anything uh, at, 
to actually change these uh, factors from an actionability or, or from the perspective of proving, improving the person's health. Uh, so based on that, so we have divided the factors of factors of explanations into 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 immutable versus uh, mutable, and then within so within mutable factors, there may be factors which are mutable, but we cannot do any intervention. So, for example, say the marital status of the person, um, and then and then there are factors which may be inter intervenable. So, for example, um, for example, say the for example, say uh, the temperature of the person, uh, which may actually be a proxy. Or say another thing, maybe the maybe the patient needs appendectomy. Um, so while we're still in the emergency department, we can also talk about explanation consistency. Uh, the, the use case we've described here is related to left without being seen. Now that is a phenomenon when a patient might come to the emergency department, um, register for care, and actually leave before they are seen by a provider. There's multiple reasons why this is can be detrimental to the patient. Um, but what we see here is actually how an explanation might differ um, across different time points. We can see that for our patient, Catherine Collins, that the main feature associated with her left out being seen score, which has remained consistent, has actually changed from being related to her past history to that of her chief complaint. Ideally, a model explanation will be consistent for a patient across different runs of the model and even across different models. Um, so, the form, uh, so from a machine learning perspective, the problem can be defined as, as follows. So given the same data set, multiple machine learning algorithms can, can be used to build models with similar, uh, with similar generalization error. Um, so, the, so, uh, so the problem is that the explanations from these multiple explainable models may be very similar. It may not be the same. Um, and especially in cases when we are getting divergent explanations, then from the perspective of the end user, that can be very confusing that we are giving very different reasonings for why we are making certain predictions or observing a particular phenomenon. So which is actually, so this particular problem of model multiplicity is related to a very active area and open area of research within explainability in general, which is how do you evaluate multiple multiple uh, explanation models within the domain of uh, machine learning. Uh, um, so not just evaluation, but comparison. Uh, so right now, uh, right now, when it comes to evaluation, two main sets of techniques um, or families of techniques are used. So one is that using human experts for evaluation, where the idea is that oh, we get the explanations from multiple models and we have human domain experts evaluate uh, how good or bad the explanations are, and then we see what is the ex expert agreement across human experts. Uh, the other way to do that is, in, and in most cases, in tandem with human evaluation, is to actually, especially in cases where the output is in the form of ranked lists, is to do machine evaluation. Um, so, so there's already a large body of literature on how do we compare ranked lists, and so basically just say, for example, to see how much agreement is across different um, different explanations that we are getting from different models? So an example would be of, of, of an example of, of such a metric is say the, say the Kendall's W, uh, and as a use case, so suppose we are getting a set of variables for a ranked list of variables, say from a model like Lime or Shapley values or say from a regression model. So we can use these techniques uh, to go compare how much agreement or difference is between them. Another important feature of model explanations should be pars parsimony in the explanation. So that is, the explanation should be as simple as possible. We know that one of the hurdles with adoption of these predictive tools in the clinical workflow is actually the ability of the end user to understand the prediction and the factors um, in a relatively expedient way. Now, it's important that the explanation associated with the risk score actually um, actually augment that and actually enable the end user to um, act on the explanation. Um, uh, so, the, uh, so the principle parsimony is directly related to the Occam's razor, um, which, which, which basically says that the simplest explanation is the best uh, explanation. 
And Occam's razor does appear in a number of contexts within computer science in general, and it's also within machine learning. So for example, we have the minimum description length, sprint, length principle. Uh, within the context of healthcare, so we can define uh, Occam's razor as, 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 as trying to de derive a unifying diagnosis that can explain all of a patient's symptoms. That said, in practice, uh, clinicians usually work with multiple, hypo multiple changes hypothesis at the same time. So within healthcare, there's, there's actually a counterpoint to Hickam's dic dictum, uh, which, which in an amusing manner says that a man can have as many diseases as he damn well pleases, where the idea is that, is that, uh, that one should not always go with the simplest explanation. Um, so within the mach machine learning domain, so there, there's a now classic paper by Pedro Domingos, uh, which actually distinguishes between the Occam's first razor and the second razor, where the Occam's first razor is it's exactly what, what we are we are used to, which is that which is that given multiple models with same generalization error, uh, the simplest model should be preferred. The second Occam's second razor says that given again given multiple models with very similar generalization error, use the one uh, which which acts, which is more explainable or understandable by a human. Um, and then, and then just to and then just to summarize the idea behind parsimony in this domain, that simplest model actually may not be uh, the best model. So the next pillar we'll describe is that of generalizability. The models and explanations should be generalizable across a problem or across a patient cohort whenever possible. We've described here a patient cohort related to diabetes and the uh, and predicting the length of stay of this patient cohort. Now, ideally, and as we can see here, the leading factor associated with this particular patient group that has um, similar comorbidities is actually quite similar. And that's what we would expect. Otherwise, the model may be too brittle. And then for the perspective of explanation within machine learning, so we can actually talk about generalizability from multiple dimensions. So there's the dimension of the model, machine learning model itself, and then there's, there's the generalizability with respect to the algorithm. Uh, so on the model side, so there are certain models uh, which, which give or generate explanations at the level of an instance. So for example, the explanation within the context of healthcare domain would only be applicable to say for a particular patient or not just a particular patient, but say for a particular encounter. Uh, it's not going to be applicable to other patients uh, or even other instances where that patient is in a healthcare facility. So examples of models like that are like Lyme, shapely value uh, models. Uh, there are other models which are, which, are act, which are applicable at the global level. So for example, decision trees, rule-based models, um, where they explain the whole phenomenon of interest. So in the other dimension of algorithmic generalizability, um, so we have model ex agnostic explanations. That is, there is models which can be used in, in tandem with any uh, any any underlying predictive model. So for example, models like Lyme or Shapely values, so you can actually use with say any predictive model. There are other models which are more specific to particular classes of models, um, say with say tree explainers or, or, or say models which are only applicable to uh, gradient boosting explainers. And then lastly, there are models which are very model specific. So these include the class of models where explanation and prediction are the same, or, or some more recent models like random quad explainers, which can only be used to extract explanations from random forest models. Trust and performance is another key quality of explanations in um, healthcare prediction. Many decisions made in healthcare are high stakes. We know that lives can truly be dependent on decisions made by providers. As a result, providers must be able to well, must be able to trust the explanations that they are acting on. Right, and then, what, and then from the perspective, of, and then within the machine learning domain, what that means is that we expect the predictive system to have sufficiently high performance on the metric of interest. So for example, for say classification, it could be precision, recall, AUC, um, because the point being that explanations which are accompanied with subpart predictions can actually foster distrust, which, is, which actually goes against the goal of having explanations to begin with. 
Uh, also, the idea is that the model should at least have parity with performance of human practitioners. The exception to that would be that when, when actually the machine does better on certain cases that humans are, are, are bad at. Uh, so traditionally, researchers talk about a trade-off between, uh, between accuracy or performance in general and interpretability that, that, that the more interpretable your model is, uh, the less accurate it, that it is going to be. Uh, more recently, there has been some progress in the, in the form of certain models like, for example, GA2Ms or using Lime or Shapely values where it is possible to overcome this. Uh, so we actually think that there is also a third dimension, which is the dimension of risk, which also informs, uh, informs the choice of algorithm that you, that you will choose. Uh. So the final pillar that we'll discuss today is that of fidelity. And that is the expectation that the explanation and the model align well with one another. We can see here we have the results of a patient's risk of readmission score. Now that's the likelihood that a patient who is recently or about to be discharged might return to the hospital for admission within the next 30 days. Now we can see that her risk is low. However, she has some significant factors that, are, that the model is saying are explaining that risk score. As a clinician, I would actually expect her risk to be much higher based on these factors. Now we would expect that the explanation in the model would have better fidelity than we see in this example. So within the field of, within the field of uh, fidelity, so researchers have borrowed the concept of soundness and completeness from a formal logic. So an explanation is sound if it adheres to how the model works, and it's complete if it encompasses the complete extent of the model itself. So which brings us to, to this brings us to two very important concepts, uh, so ad hoc models and post hoc models. Ad hoc models are models where the predictive model and the explanation model is the same. Um, and in post hoc models, these two models are actually different. Uh, and then there's also a special case of, of, um, of, of mimic models. So an, as an example of fidelity, uh, so consider the phenomenon of predicting or the use case of predicting uh, predicting a readmission to a hospital. So we could use, say, a feature like say, the lunar cycles, and there are actually research papers which show that it's highly effective, but that does not mean that it's, it has fidelity to the underlying phenomenon. Um, so special mention should be made about mimic models. So the idea behind mimic models is that, so if we, if we have a complex model which is really good in, in, in prediction, we can take the output of that model and the initial feature set to actually uh, train a new model. So basically the output of the model becomes, becomes, a, becomes our target variable. And so the new model that we train uh, in general, although there are no theoretical guarantees, does have good perf performance overall. Um, so that's how we can, we, can, we can take a complex model and then convert that into, a, into an understandable model. Uh, so that brings us to the closure of, of the seven uh, pillars of explainability. Um, so, so as an as an as an audience poll, uh, so from your perspective, which of these seven pillars are most relevant to the problem or the domain of your interest that you're currently working on? So you can actually select more than one of these pillars. Thank you, Mohammed and Dr. Carly. Uh, the audience considers fidelity, transparency, and trust to be uh, very important, uh, and the others uh, not so. To conclude this webinar and take questions, uh, we would like to focus everyone's attention on why we consider explainable MN in healthcare AI to be such an important topic. Uh, it is our mission to understand artificial intelligence uh, in the clinical domain to make it effective. While we do so, we consider that the ability of AI to provide accompanying explanations to aid decision support in healthcare is extremely important. In fact, it is so important that we consider ourselves to be on a journey from artificial intelligence to what we term as assistive intelligence in order to make machine learning pipelines and models more useful by humans, medical professionals and clinicians in the healthcare space more effective and actionable. In the end, I would like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar with us today.
It is our firm belief that healthcare needs help and hope. Uh, we are on a mission to help uh, understand through the way of AI and ML, the utility of uh, serving patients at large and improving patient outcomes. Do join us on this mission and journey. Uh, you can email us uh, uh, on the address here, or you can uh, join the movement by joining us on Twitter at Kensa. Thanks again for participation, and we'll take a few questions from the audience. Vikas? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we have some questions around uh, evaluation, so we'll take one of those, uh, and anyone can feel free to answer here. Uh, so there were many questions on like, how do we evaluate explainable, explainable models, and also how do we identify bias or fairness, uh, as well as if any new diseases is in the data, how a model can identify that. So there are many, as you can see, there are many questions here. Uh, one way to answer this, uh, I'll take the first one for the fairness. It's a very important one in healthcare, and especially when looking at EMR data, there are many type of patients that could be possible in the cohort. And the one way that we were looking at is evaluating our models for different cohorts of patients and how the model performs for those different cohorts. And especially if one model has been uh, learned over the data set, then how that model is performing within each cohort. And we have identified some differences based on age, based on sex, as well as based on race. Uh, and uh, one very quick answer to that why those differences exist is because of the sparsity in the data for specific race or specific age. And we have realized that oversampling or some kind of those techniques can help avoid those unfairness in the data. Uh, any other answer here to address like new disease or the evaluation of explanation? So uh, identifying um, new diseases or other disease progressions in the healthcare space is a very complex problem. Uh, the lack of or rather the sparsity of data uh, for rare diseases often affects the quality of the machine learning models. In fact, uh, this is a very open area of research today uh, in trying to understand how predictions made for rare disease progression can actually be accompanied by suitable explanations. And uh, we have not found any groundbreaking work yet that helps uh, us understand this domain better. So very interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a concrete answer to that question, but it's a ripe area of research. Good. Uh, also, another question uh, among the audience, the most common one was whether the end user here is a healthcare provider or a patient. Uh, in our case, where we are predicting risk, uh, as well as the score for various kind of uh, uh, compliance for the patient. Uh, we are kind of focused on a healthcare perspective or the healthcare provider perspective, and Dr. Carly here can actually add some more into that. Yeah, just to add to that, I think a lot of the use cases that we presented today were based on uh, operations, so based on, you know, how do we reduce some of the inefficiencies in the healthcare system by providing patient-level predictions. So some of those end users would be um, perhaps nurses or administrators that might, um, you know, be able to pull some levers associated with system um, processes. Some of the other use cases that we presented, such as perhaps risk of patient deterioration or, um, uh, you know, risk of admission, might also definitely have a clinical or care component. And in those cases, the primary end user um, may be a clinician, so a physician or another type of medical provider. Uh, so unfortunately, we'll, we'll aim to answer most of the question if it is there uh, through the test, and uh, it is time, and we'll close here. Ankur, you have anything to say? Great. Thanks a lot, everyone, uh, and I would like to thank my co-presenters for participating in this very interesting seminar. Hope we have all gained a bit of perspective on healthcare machine learning uh, and the importance of explainable ML in this space. Um, I again appreciate feedback and would love to hear from you and continue the discussion online uh, on the ACM uh, uh, discussion forum. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, highlight a few housekeeping items again. The learning continues. Questions and comments about this podcast uh, and uh, the webcast can be uh, sent to learning at acm.org. Uh, and here are a few resources pointing to the 
to the resource. Thanks a lot again. Bye. Thank you.